Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 And when the women saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God, walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, amongst the trees of the garden. So I'm sure we all know that God's voice doesn't have legs. So what does he mean by when he says the voice of the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day? So if we go to the strong concordance and find the word cool, it means wind, it means breath. So God's breath, the wind, the breeze is the cool of the day. That's his voice that walked in the garden. And that's why Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of God for amongst the trees of the garden, so they wouldn't feel his breeze, his presence, as effectively. So why is this UFO, this unidentified flying object, concealing itself amongst the clouds? And Moses spake unto Aaron, Say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Did you guys see that? Page 329 in the book Sinai Design by Joe Richardson. The importance of the cloud within the biblical narrative cannot be overstated. Apart from the incarnation, when God himself actually took on flesh, the manifestation of the Most High's presence in the pillar of the cloud and fire is the single greatest way in which the Most High has ever revealed himself. Ask any biblically literate Jew, either in modern times or in the first century, what is the surest sign of God's presence? The answer, no doubt, would be the visible sign of the pillar of cloud and fire. Throughout the Old Testament period, the pillar was not simply one of the many other equal signs. Rather, it was the single greatest and definitive sign of the Most High's presence. Okay, are you guys telling me that there's an alien spaceship in that fucking cloud right there? It doesn't move like a ship. What you mean, OJ? What if it's not a ship? So why is the Most High, or the UFO in the cloud, taking people? Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 to 38. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving into marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. For as I conceive in my understanding, woe unto them that shall be left in those days, and much more woe unto them that are not left behind. For they that were not left were in heaviness, now understand I the things that are laid up in the latter days, which shall happen unto them, and to those that are left behind. Therefore are they come into great perils and many necessities, like as these dreams declare. Yet it is easier for him that is in danger to come into these things, than to pass away as a cloud out of this world, and not to see the things that happen in the last days. This movie is about a coming great tribulation. That's why it says, Woe unto them! that shall be left in those days. Another reason why I know this movie is about the Great Tribulation is by the fact that in Gematria, the practice of coding numbers into words, the word tribulation 
synchronized with no movie. Because this is what this movie is about. That's why the main character, OJ, was an equestrian. He was involved with horses. Because we're talking about the four horsemen in the book of Revelation. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard, as if it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And this is what this movie is talking about. It's about surviving the four horsemen, and the plagues that they bring. And if you are not one of those people that were left behind, then that means you were taken by the plagues of the four horsemen. Second Esther chapter 13 verse 20 to 22. And he answered unto me and said, The interpretation of the vision shall I show thee, and I will open unto thee the thing that thou hast required, whereas thou hast spoken of them that are left behind. This is the interpretation. He that shall endure the peril in that time have kept himself. They that be fallen into danger are as such as have works and faith toward the Almighty. Know this, therefore, that they which be left behind are more blessed than they that be dead. We pissed them off. We're not the reason to settle down here. That was Jew. He got caught up trying to tame a predator. You can't do that. You got to end an agreement with one. Okay. I'm asking is someone who was in the house when the shit went down. Mm -hmm. How exactly do you enter an agreement with a fucking a UFO alien entity or whatever the hell you want to call it? Gene Jack. Call him Gene Jack. He said, how do you enter into an agreement with an alien entity? You have to be chosen. Psalm chapter 132 verse 13. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He have desired it for his habitation. It's a live animal. It's an animal. It's territorial, and it thinks that this is its home. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. For you chose the descendants of Abraham above all the nations, and you put your name upon us, Lord, and it will not cease forever. You made a covenant with our ancestors concerning us, and we hope in you when we turn our souls toward you. May the mercy of the Lord be upon the house of Israel forevermore. So the covenant that the Israelites have with the Most High is that agreement with the alien entity. We previously saw how the Most High declared his intentions to take Israel as his own. Now, in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, they finally arrived at Mount Sinai. This is where the Most High went beyond merely making his intentions known and actually proposed to Israel. Now then, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Exodus chapter 19 verse 5 The word here for possession is a very special Hebrew word, segula. It refers to a king's most highly prized and most treasured possession. In essence, Israel was being offered the opportunity to be the most highest crown jewel. This is why Kiki Palmer's character was named Emerald. And she was even wearing an emerald in the movie. Because we're talking about God's people. His jewels. The Jews. Because those that descend from the victims of the transatlantic slave trade are the real Jews. We are God's chosen people. Uh, we have different tribes all over. But the largest is the Igbo tribe of Nigeria, numbering 40 million people. Who self-identify as being from the children of Israel. They're doing eight-day circumcision out there. They have a lot of customs, uh, you know, from Jewish weddings to Jewish mourning that you'll only find amongst Mosaic law. And they are going through their own political struggles right now. There's almost there was a genocide on them in the 1960s. Millions of them were killed. Israel actually broke the blockade. But why the Igbo are most uh, most fascinating is because they're actually returning now to Judaism. There's I think 48 synagogues now in Nigeria who are from the Igbo, and that number is growing rapidly. The leader of the Free Igbo Movement, if you will Google, um, his name is NNAMD Madi. Um, he wears a talit, a prayer shawl, to his court appearances when he like goes in for you know treason trials. He's wearing his talit. 
But the Igbo made up a significant percentage of the transatlantic slave trade, significant percentage of the transatlantic slave trade, significant percentage of the transatlantic slave trade. So a lot of the blacks that were taken to America on the slave ships actually had Igbo blood in them. And we see now Igbo are self-identifying as from the tribes of Israel. So if you look in America today, you'll see a lot of celebrities actually from the African-American community claiming Hebrew roots. Uh, reference would be Amari Stoudemire, high-profile basketball player, rapper Kendrick Lamar, who's, you know, got, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a billion views on some of his stuff. Uh, he, he's These are people who are influential, and people look at them like maybe they're crazy. Like how do they have any ties to the tribes of Israel? And then all of a sudden, we see the actual ships that brought him here are coming from the exact place in Africa where it's an Israelite hotbed. So this is going to be uh, also an interesting piece of the puzzle. Page 29. The first component of the biblical betrothal wedding ceremony is the mikvah. Before the ceremony could begin, the Most High commanded the people to wash and consecrate themselves for the ceremony. The Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments, and let them be ready. Exodus chapter 19 verse 10 And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings, and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and stood at the never part of the mount. Earlier, we referenced the Ketubah, the legally binding contract that at any biblical or Jewish wedding is both read aloud and signed. Whether or not a formal marriage contract was common during the time of Exodus is not known. What is clear, however, is that the reading aloud of the Torah is treated within the biblical narrative like a marriage contract. The Ten Commandments, then, may be viewed as a summary of the wedding vows. They form the legal framework and very foundation of the Sinaitic Covenant. Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. The people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Thus, upon completion of the reading of Ketubah in unison, the people agreed. The agreement was both individual and corporate. He got caught up trying to tame a predator. You can't do that. You got to end an agreement with one. The imagery of all this is stunning. After sprinkling the blood over the people, or more likely onto the pillars the side of the altar, which stood as a representative of the people, Moses once more read the complete contents of the covenant out loud to the congregation. Out of this context, they again affirmed their commitment to keep everything noted within the covenant. Then, one final time, Moses splashed the people with more blood. Thus, the Mosaic covenant was sealed with a vivid, gruesome, and bloody display. Stewart states that the sealing of the covenant with blood symbolized the shared responsibility of the two parties, as well as the severity of the penalty for breaking the covenant. In other words, as powerful as the conclusion of any marriage ceremony is, with the bride and the bridegroom, each making vows unto death, the Sinaitic covenant actually took it a step further. If the Israelites failed to keep the conditions of the covenant, the penalty would be death. <laughs> 